Here are my final tips for paper one in A-level physics. My first tip is to read the question really carefully. Let's illustrate this. We have a cyclist that moves along a horizontal road. She pushes on the pedal with a constant power of 250 watts. We're given the mass over here and some more detail. We want to calculate the energy provided of the cyclist each minute. It's very possible to miss out little details such as this. So I'm just going to underline each minute. And we're given the overall efficiency. Well, we're given the power and power is just energy or work done over time, meaning that the energy is just power multiplied by time. So in one second, we will have 250 joules of energy. Notice how I'm writing out quite a lot and I'm explaining my working out. Remember, you're trying to showcase your knowledge. Writing out formulas in little details such as these ones will not only help organize your thoughts, but it will make it far more likely for you to score marks because the examiners will know what you're actually writing. So, in 60 seconds, this would mean that we will have 250 multiplied by 60, which is gonna be, what, 15,000 joules. Now, what we've actually calculated is the useful power, isn't it? So that's the power that, with which she pushes on the pedals. But the efficiency of the muscles is only around 65%. So 0.65 will be equal to the useful of the total power. Our useful power was 15,000, let's call it E total, or total energy rather than power, meaning that E total will be 15,000 divided by 0.65, giving us 2.3, 2.3, multiply this by 10 to the power of 4 joules. Next one, calculate the drag force and hence the instantaneous acceleration of the cyclist when the speed is 6 meters per second. Okay, let's start off with the easy bit. We're going to calculate the drag force and we're given a formula here. So we can say that the drag force is just going to be 0.4 v squared. And notice how I'm writing out the formula even if um, the equation is given over here because I'm far less likely to write a mistake if I just write out a formula. I won't miss a square probably. It's just a little bit less likely. So 0.4 multiply this by 6 squared. And our drag force is 14.4 newtons. Because this was one of the requirements, we're likely to have scored a mark already. For the next one, we're looking for the instantaneous acceleration. Now, anytime you have a question with regards to Newton's laws, do me a favor and just draw a little diagram. We're just going on a horizontal road and there's gonna be some amount of power going um, leading us to a driving force. Let's just call that F. There's going to be some drag force this way. And the cyclist is being accelerated, so therefore the net force will be in the direction of motion. The acceleration, we're going to use Newton's second law in the form that the net force, F net, is mass times acceleration. Now our instantaneous acceleration will be F minus D divided by M, which is gonna be... Okay, we don't have the force just yet, but we can figure it out because we know the constant power and we know the speed. Another tip, if you get a mechanics question with power, always use P is equal to F multiplies by by V. This normally happens whenever we get power in mechanics. This means that the force is just going to be P over V. So we're going to get power over V, take away D over M, which is going to be 250 over 6. Take away the drag force, 14.4, divided by the mass, which is 85. Let's see what we get we get an acceleration of 0.32 meters per second squared. Next one, we have a diagram. The cyclist now moves up a slope at a constant speed of six meters per second and continues to exert a power of 250 watts on the pedals. Okay, this means that the driving force will still be the same. Figure 17.1 represents the cyclist and the bicycle at a single point P on the slope. 
draw arrows to represent the forces acting on P. Label each arrow with the force it represents. Remember, whenever we have to use arrows, please use a ruler. We're going to have some drag force, which is opposing the motion, first of all. We're also going to have the driving force from the pedal, which is going to be up here. And this will be a little bit bigger because now we'll also have to overcome the component of the weight along the slope. Let's label this as driving force. Significant number of students actually tend to forget just to label arrows. So tomorrow you're very likely to have to label a force. Please don't forget to not just draw it, but draw the actual label as well or write the actual label. Okay, we have one more force, which is the weight, and the weight will just act vertically downwards. This will have parallel and perpendicular components, but we're not really asked to resolve it. This is just a one marker so far. Okay, calculate the angle theta to the horizontal. Okay, well, tell you what, I'm just going to set up the equation on this page over here, just to show you what I mean in terms of the diagram. But in the exam, please write on the appropriate place. So let's say that our driving force is F. Let's say our drag is D. And then the weight can be resolved into two components. Some of, one of the components will be perpendicular. We don't, we don't really need to worry about this one, but there will also be a component of the weight which will be along the slope right across here. This component of the weight will just be mg sine of the angle. And now we can resolve the forces along the slope just like in mechanics. Because we're moving at a constant speed, we can say that the force F take away mg sine theta, take away the drag force, but the drag force was given in the question to be 0.4 uh, v squared. So we can write 0.4 v squared has to be equal to zero. In other words, the driving force has to be equal to both of these. Okay, well, we're looking for the angle. So I'm just gonna make mg sine theta the subject. Notice how I'm not plugging in numbers until pretty much the very end. This means that I will only be using my calculator once and I'm less likely to make a mistake this way. Although it would be quite ironic if I do a mistake at the moment, but let's see what happens. Theta will be inverse sine, run the force, I'm gonna write power over V, take away 0.4 V squared over uh, mg, which is inverse sine of 250 over 6, take away 0.4 times 6 squared, 85 times 9.81. And this here is going to give us an answer of 1.87. Now, how many significant figures should we use? Well, all of these are given up to two significant figures. So I'm going to say that theta is 1.9 degrees. Okay, next one, we have a wordy question. The cyclist continues to move up the slope at six meters per second, then approaches a gap. How exciting. Of width 2.5 meters as shown. A student has calculated that the cyclist will be able to clear the gap and land on the other side. Another student suggests that this calculation has assumed there is no drag and has not accounted for the effect caused by the front wheel losing contact with the slope. Okay, without calculation. Wait, without calculation? But I really enjoy calculations. <sighs> Discuss how drag and the front wheel losing contact with the, with the slope will affect the motion and explain how these might affect the size of the gap that can be crossed successfully. Okay, so the way to tackle these is to break them down into components. Individually, they're not too bad. If we just look at this, it says without calculation, discuss how drag will affect the motion. Okay, let's do this bit first. So I will say that drag will reduce the velocity. This means that if the velocity is reduced, well, in general, the range, because the bicycle will act as a projectile, will be reduced. I think I actually see what they mean with the front wheel losing contact. So 
if the front wheel loses contact and anyone that's uh, been on a bike and maybe done a jump um, on a bike knows that you instinctively pull your body backwards as you're jumping on the bike. The reason for that is you're bringing your center of mass in the opposite direction, so towards the pivot, meaning that you're less likely to lose height on the front wheel. So unless that is done, the front wheel will start going downwards, meaning that you'll be more likely to impact the edge. Let's see if we can put that into words. I know that Lewis from Physics Online is probably really good at jumping on a bike, so I'll be curious to see his opinion. I am going to do one calculation though, and that is that the, because we're given the width of the gap, we're given an actual number. They shouldn't give us numbers unless they want us to do some amount of calculations. But if the speed is, let's say it's even six meters per second and it's at an angle of 1.9 degrees, so six cosine of nine, that's a speed of 5.9, which is virtually six along the slope. The time at which uh, the bicycle is going to cross the gap is gonna be given by 2.5 over six, which is gonna be tiny. Technically 5.9, but this just is a little estimation. So that's around 0.4 seconds. So I think that all of those effects are likely to be insignificant. However, 2.5 meters is quite the gap, so I would prefer to have a much shorter gap to jump. The trick with suggest and discuss questions is to base your conclusions on real correct physics. We know that if the, she's traveling at six meters per second and the gap is 2.5 meters, it's gonna be way less than a second for her to cross the gap. So we know that what we've written here has to be true and it will very likely score some marks. Good luck tomorrow guys for some more invaluable question practice. Click over here.